My name is Jane Guberman, and today is Thursday, March 23rd, 2017. I'm here with Alan Mintz at his home in New York City, and we're going to record an interview for the Jewish Counterculture Oral History Project. Alan, do I have your permission to record this interview? You do. So as you know, today we're going to explore your experiences during the late 60s and early 70s, and particularly your involvement in the New York Kabbalah and the impact that Havara had on your own life and beyond in the larger Jewish community. So I'd like to start by talking about your personal family um, background and to flesh out a bit who you were at the time that you got involved in the Havara. So let's begin with your family. When you were growing up, you were born in 1947 in Worcester, Massachusetts. Correct. Can you tell us briefly about your family when you were growing up? Uh, my mother, my father, I have a brother who's uh, two years younger than I am. Uh, my father was born in Worcester. His father came there from Lithuania at the end of the 19th century and died when my father was nine years old in the influenza of 1918. My father was one of a very large number of children on the lower side. And uh, he returned to Worcester after World War II, after meeting my mother, in Portland, Maine, uh, and bringing her to Worcester and uh, establishing a life there as he had a law degree, but he uh, was an insurance broker and, uh, you know, very modest, but I think came up a little bit with the, the wave of pro, you know, post war pr prosperity. So he moved into a house on a kind of a nicer part of town, and uh, my mother did not work outside the home. She was a homemaker throughout your childhood? Uh, yes, that's right. She had worked beforehand, but not, not afterwards, which I've come to understand was very much the, the aspiration of anyone who could afford to do that. Uh, and so uh, we lived in a residential part of Worcester, not really the suburbs within, within Worcester, in a mixed neighborhood. Uh, but my life was quite Jewish. We were members of a conservative synagogue, and my brother and I were sent to uh, Hebrew school, which was a serious undertaking in those days, in junior congregation on Saturday mornings, uh, public schools uh, all along. There was one small uh, elementary yeshiva run by uh, Lubavitch in Worcester, but that, that was it. Uh, and uh, I would say we were differentiated from my father's siblings, from others, in, in some kind of tendency toward more traditionalism. All within Worcester? Living in Worcester? Uh, some, yes, some no. Mm -hmm. Some moved to New York and lived elsewhere. So I think we were the, the one or two kosher homes among my father's uh, extended family. And the uh, decision to send us to the Hebrew school that was more Hebraist in orientation. And it's interesting because my father himself was sent for several years to a new kind of Hebrew school in Worcester called the Ivria School. Called uh, the what school? Ivria. From mm -hmm. Ivrit, from Hebrew at the time. So uh, the role of Hebrew as something which was an educational ideal in the community was perhaps uh, special to New England. It seems like places like Springfield and Hartford and Boston, there's a lot of immigrants from Lithuania, uh, high, very Zionist and, uh, and connected to Hebrew within a uh, you know, synagogue orientation. That's not true everywhere, but it was, mm -hmm. uh, I think, characteristic of the New England uh, Jewish educational scene. What kind of Hebrew education did you actually get as a child? We went to uh, afternoon Hebrew school. That was, I think, three times a week, maybe four, I'm not sure. And it was, uh, it was a Hebraist curriculum that was coordinated from the Board of Education in Boston, which emphasized Bible, uh, Jewish history, Siddur, uh, and, and Hebrew language. Uh, and it was conducted in Hebrew uh, most of the time as well. And th that was till uh, six. You're talking basically about the 50s, right? As, a, yeah. as the time that you were in this. That's in this right. World. And then. Coming up to, uh, let's say, the end of grade six, mm -hmm. 
grade seven, uh, those who wanted to were mo motivated went on to a high school program that was an extension of the prose door of the Hebrew College in Boston, called the Hebrew Teachers College at the time. And that was more ambitious. That was four days a week, and it was a curriculum set by Boston, and we were taught in Worcester, but we sent exams by Boston. And uh, that was more ambitious in terms of, uh, of Hebrew uh, acquisition, uh, history. There was some Talmud that was done, but not a great deal. Any emphasis on modern Hebrew? Yes, yes. So and, and, and Bible, and, and Bible, and with the, the Israeli pronunciation also. There were other schools, like my friend Barry Holtz, who uh, was educated in with Israel. They were educated in Ashkenazis. Not in, uh, not in Sephardi, Hebrew, right? Although B'nai Moshe, uh, at the time, was the Hebrew, the Israeli pronunciation. So these were differences in the, uh, in the community at the time. And how did you feel about your Hebrew education at the time? It was part of my life. And I think when I got into junior high school, I began to experience it as a resource. I mean, if you looked around at other kids growing up, you know, I, our class was, these were the years when uh, middle schools and high schools were, 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 were uh, what do they call them? Sectioned. What's the word for it? In other oh, words, uh, uh, tracked. Tracked. Yeah, tracked. So we were in the college track, track which mm -hmm. had a lot of Jews, but a lot of other folks. And there was no other heritage immigrant group in America that had a connection to any other language. Even the kids who were Catholics by that time really weren't learning Latin. So I, I felt uh, proud and somewhat unique in knowing this classical language. Uh, and it became something that was a asset for me when I went into my high school years and I became involved in youth group activities. Having this kind of literacy set me apart from others and uh, gave me something that was, was my own. So it, it, it had more meaning to me as time went on. It's also that during my junior year, high school years, toward the end of it, I decided to become more observant. We had a, a home where we kept kosher in the home, but we ate treif outside. We uh, you know, had a Friday night dinner, but then my father took my brother and me to the YMCA to go swimming afterwards. We went to junior congregation Shabbos morning, but often went bowling afterwards. It was kind of very uh, traditional, but loosey goosey. In no sense halachic, in the sense of. And at a certain point, I made a decision that I wanted to be consistent about certain things. Was that fairly common in the congregation and the community that you were living in? To that sort of more loosey goosey uh, mode. Yes, I think so. I mean, I don't. Mm -hmm. What was you among your friends? That's yes, that yes. People did that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, what motivated you to become more interested in being uh, more observant, more traditional? A number of factors. I think part of it was getting exposed to something beyond Worcester through the conservative movements, youth organization, United Synagogue Youth, USY, uh, in which Jew. Jewish observance and knowledge of Hebrew was an asset that made you attractive to become a leader. And I wanted that kind of importance or self-exposure. But I think it's something also that was uh, part of a family, family dynamic as well, that uh, this was the way, the basis on which I could differentiate myself from my father, who had an interest in this and valued it, but I could take it much more seriously, no more, in a sense, uh, outpace him or do an end run around him, his authority by being uh, more knowledgeable about things that he, that he valued. And I think it also connected to an adolescent sensitivity and a disposition to you know, religious experiences, that it, it connected to that and, and, and uh, gave me a way of, of, of deepening yeah. those experiences. What kinds of activities were you involved in in USY? And what, what really drew you to being so involved in the youth movement? <sighs> Both because you were involved not only locally, but ultimately nationally. Yes. Um, 
You know, it's a difficult question to answer because uh, it's not like a sports where, where there is a activity that you do or a hobby oriented kind of thing. This was having meetings and it was a way of connecting with other kids. So you'd go to, you know, uh, meetings and conferences in other towns and this was a way of being in other people's homes and visiting. Uh, for me, it was a kind of combination of uh, validating this Jewish Hebraic thing that was important to me, and not just validating it, but uh, allowing it to distinguish me and make me important. And I think I had a need to maybe come, come came from a lack of social uh, sense of inner security. So this is what would dis distinguish me and put me in a position of being admired or esteemed mm -hmm. by other people. Mm -hmm. I emphasize that because I eventually did become the national or international president, which was a big deal. I mean, when I was in my senior of high school, every weekend I traveled to a different part of the country as the president to visit the these conferences. And when I came, I was adulated. I was really uh, like... And it was, I realized afterwards, a uh, more my need for, for importance than it was anything that was, had inherent value in it. And when I stepped back from it, uh, when I arrived at college, I was extremely critical of the organization for replicating what I thought was the worst aspects of adult behavior, hierarchy and uh, regalia and, uh, you know, uh, petty and importance and offices and, and things like that. And uh, at the time, I didn't own up to the fact that these were my issues and things that I needed, but I felt that the, uh, I felt traduced by adult culture, that they, that they, that they were vicariously kind of living off of us teenagers. And uh, it was kind of the worst parts of, you know, suburban congregational Jewish life. And at the time I had another model, which was beginning to be Camp Ramah and things relating to JTS. That is a definition of, of Judaism that was more substantive and less uh, social in this way. It's also the culture of USY was, was about uh, observing the mitzvot, it was all about, it wasn't about knowledge, it wasn't, wasn't really about intellectual engagement. I went to Israel for the first time between 10th uh, and 11th uh, and grade with so US, was USY that, pilgrimage. This was 63, something like that? It was 63, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it was a wonderful summer, I met a lot of people, John Roske was there and, and others. Uh, but I resented the fact that, that this group of 120 of us, they made us daven three times a day. It was always public as if to show off that even though we were conservative Jews, we prayed three times a day and so forth. And that the kind of piety for show or the emphasis on observance as a kind of a token of, of Jewishness uh, was striking me by that time already as a misplaced emphasis. Did it feel somehow devoid of a, a spirit, a real spiritual dimension? And an intellectual dimension, both. Both those two, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, when I, uh, I came to Columbia after uh, high school, and in my sophomore year, uh, I and a group of other people whom, whom I had met the summer before in this concert training program at Ramah, started a magazine called Response Magazine. So this was 60... I think 67. 67, I think. Was, right, and I, I was the chair of the board, and, and a small board, and in the first issue, I, uh, what was important to me was to write a critique of USY, uh, and it's along these lines, mm -hmm. and uh, that's an important part of my differentiation a kind of splitting whereby on the one hand was the, uh, the culture of conservative congregations, rabbis that were to claim oratory, big gap between the, the bima and, and, and the pews, 
uh, you know, this non-intellectual emphasis on observance and so forth, and a different kind of substantive Judaism that I was seeing more in Ramah and uh, figures aligned there. To, and when I, I also took courses at JTS. When but I interestingly, was well. Ramah was coming was a conservative movement. Yeah, that was the in, that was the inner kind of cleavage within the conservative movement. They had their own uh, youth group called LTF, Leaders Training Fellowship or something. Who, who had their own? The conservative movement. Right. Through, through... So this was the elite... Yes, it, it was not... It was uh, Yes, I, just, I think it existed just in a few places. Mm -hmm. It was not something ever uh, available to me. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, so... Uh, for me, the fact that there was another track that was a serious, non-orthodox uh, form of Judaism that was not the congregational youth movement model enabled me, in a sense, to stay within something vaguely you know, connected to the conservative movement. Mm -hmm. Although uh, I never would want to have been associated with the, the movement, per se, conservative of the capital C. Mm -hmm. By that time, and this leads into the Havara, there was no desire to, uh, you know, to be, uh, to be affiliated. Right. I want to, before we move to that, though, I wanted to ask you about your experiences in Jewish camps before Ramah, because you went to yes. Young Judea earlier. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. It should be noted that there were a number of, of Young Judea camps. This is not uh, Tel Yehuda, which was the the major movement camp for the the youth movement. This was a a camp in, in New Hampshire uh, that was it had a Zionist curriculum. It was obviously a kosher camp, and it was Sabbath observant. But uh, there was emphasis on you know, Hebrew folk dancing and singing, and uh, you know, kind of a nationalist interp interpretation of some of the holidays. And that was that was basic for me because many of my friends. And their families, the kids were being sent to a YMCA camp near Worcester. Even uh, my friend Eric Yaffe, who became head of the reform movement, who was uh, part of my class all along, and mm -hmm. I think was sent to Camp Morgan, which was the YMCA camp, and so obviously he survived it. Uh, but uh, it was, that was very formative, I think. How did your parents decided to send you to this young Judea camp, what, and what was the kind of relationship did they have with Israel? I, 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 it's a good question, and I wish, I wish they were you know, still around to, to ask them. I'm not sure. I think it was some traditionalist instinct that, uh, and uh, maybe an identification of, on my father's part with uh, some of his education from when he was a child. I, I'm not quite sure. We have uh, a branch of our family in Israel. One of my father's older sisters uh, married a Zionist, and they established themselves in Israel, and there are several families and so forth, and some other cousins who have emigrated as well. So there's a connection there, although my parents did not visit until uh, they were, you know, you know advanced middle age, I think. Um, Had they been by the time you went on the pilgrimage? I believe, so, I believe so, but I'm not sure. I can't quite remember. Hmm. Um, so looking back, as you're sort of coming into college, what would you say were the most formative influences on your sense of Jewish identity at that point? And how would you have described where you were? Well. <clears throat> I mentioned Hebrew, which I think is, is very important because it gave me <clears throat> a key to unlock a lot of Jewish texts that, that other people could access only in translation and only through various mediations. And, you know, the, the, the question of my feeling self-important is I could do that aside the, the access that gave me. In other words, when I was in high school, I could read you know, Hasidic stories and texts and Bible and, and, you know, and simple poetry. 
and uh, so that direct connection, both to Israel and to Jewish culture, was was very important. Uh, I think Heschel, reading his books, The Sabbath and The Earth of the Lords, was important. I read Mordechai Kaplan as well, and his notions of Jewish peoplehood were important to me, even though I was not close to a kind of a nationalist Zionist orientation, but but it, it gave me a language for talking about uh, uh, the Jewish people changing over time, facing different challenges and developing their institutions, and also a, a non-supernaturalist language uh, as well. So, I mean, I grew up eighth, ninth, tenth grade already knowing about the various positions in Revelation and how you could you know, talk about Revelation in a way that was not simply you know, God giving the Torah to, to Moses and, and Sinai. And uh, it was part of that, that culture in my own reading of uh, uh, you know, th a variety of theological options that were uh, you know, rather evolved uh, at that time. And uh, it's also that I, I think it was sometime in high early high school that I met Art Green. I met Art Green at a, a U.S. wine encampment. There was at the end of the summer, there was a a month after the regular summer camps had ended, U.S. why I would go to one of these camps and have a, a week-long thing. And I met Art Green for the first time. He was a year out of Brandeis. He had spent a year in Israel teaching English in tough neighborhoods, teaching Shakespeare and translation and so forth. And that's when I, that's when I first met him. I think he's about, when well, he's about to go into rabbinical school, I think he's about five years older than I am, or five years Difference no, in school. 42, I think he's 142 or 43. Yeah, right. And uh, and so I, you know, that, that was a connection. And I, I'm, uh, we'll get to the the differences between my relationship to what you know art and the, and the cover I represented. But but there was, uh, you know, there were models around uh, at that time. And also there are other models uh, through Rama, uh, the director of the New England camp, uh, Ray Artst. Uh, the Camp in Palmer. The Camp in Palmer, right. He was a progressive thinker and somebody who read a lot of theology and anthropology. And I don't, I don't know if he's a great administrator, but he was a very good uh, kind of thought stimulator for, uh, for younger people and very encouraging uh, as well. Are you talking about, you, you first went to Ramah the summer before your senior year in high school? That's right. As that, a camp, what, what was your status there at that point? Well, the, it wasn't at that camp. It was in the camp, that's now a day camp in Nyack. That was being used at the, at the time for a seminar for, for kids going from their, I think, junior senior years uh, who didn't go to Israel. In other words, in the Ramah system, that was the year you went on Ramah seminar to Israel. I had been the year before through US, USY. So this was for kids who weren't going to Israel. And uh, so that was my first experience. So it was, I, as a camper, but it was more as a participant in the seminar. It was very, you know, weighted on study. And, uh, Avram Holtz was the director of the camp, and uh, David Gordis uh, was there, and one, uh, one of the Friedman brothers, not Shama Friedman, it was a serious, uh, Jacob Milgram, it was like a heavy-duty thing. And what was your response to it? Uh, I was, it was great for me. I really, I was very, uh, very receptive to it. I met a lot of great people. And then the next summer was the, the counselor training program in the Poconos camp called Madur. So this was already after your first year of college? No, it was between, oh, before, se between senior, college, senior right, school. right. Then after that, I, I became a staff member at the, at the Palmer camp. Uh, under Ray Arts, Bob Abramson, and others, and was part of a number of people who were involved in the Chavarar later, Richard Siegel, uh, Joe, Joe Reamer, uh, Gail Reamer, others. Yeah. Do you want to say anything else about the, the impact of Ramah on, on your own thinking, your feeling, 
Yeah, I would. I mean, again, it's prefaced by the fact that I was not a raw camper. I came into it already when I was, you know, on my way to college, essentially. And uh, it was really at a kind of apex of the counterculture. And uh, here we were, a bunch of 19, 20, 21 year old uh, people. And uh, uh, this particular camp was receptive to all sorts of experimental things. And by experimental, I'm not talking about you know, drugs and sex particularly, but more in terms of educational techniques. Of we tried very hard to make prayer meaningful. We, we would meet and have all sorts of, come up with all sorts of ideas about how to make it alive for the, you know, for the campers. And, uh, and was that in and of itself a kind of radical idea? As opposed to just, I mean, given what you had grown up with, in terms of and what yes. your education had been about. And well, going back to the, this kind of you know, status quo consensual thing of, of the, the synagogues wanting the show to go on, this was trying to look at it, what does it mean, how radical in the sense of going back to the roots and trying to take it apart. And so, for example, what we tried to do with the prayers with the children is to, is to, to look at the the components of the statutory morning service and get to the experiences behind them. So if, the, if there were the, the two blessings before the Shema, the first one has to do with creation, the second one has to do with love and learning. So we would do exercises with the children trying to, campers, trying to get them to uh, kind of focus on notions of, of nature, creation, and the wonder, and, and so forth, so they could see that there was some experiential base that connected to the words of the of the liturgy. So that was it. It, it was interesting in the sense that the, the ultimate goal was to make the traditional formula relevant and usable, uh, but by kind of taking it apart and trying to trying to come at it from a more experiential way. You graduated high school in 1965 and then went on right. to your undergraduate years at Columbia. How did you decide on Columbia and what were you interested in studying? I think, I think the idea of coming to New York was enormously attractive to me. Uh, I also was accepted at the University of Chicago and that had no connections to me. In other words, it was not uh, the magnet. It was, things were here, JTS was here. Uh, the idea of being in the city and being you know, liberated from the provinces was uh, a, a big draw. What's interesting also is that in those days it was easier to get into Columbia. Columbia today is, is much more selective than it was then, in part because the fortunes of New York City at that time. New York City was, especially the Upper West Side, was a kind of a grungy and somewhat crime-ridden place to come. and. Uh, you know, now getting into Columbia in terms of selectivity is, you know, it's there with, you know, you know, with, with the best ivies. Not at the time. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but so, JTS was a draw for you, you're saying? I think so, ways. yeah. Because, mm -hmm. again, because of the, not so much because I was a conservative movement Jew, but because of the, uh, you know, the, the learning that, that seemed to be centered there and it represented something that was serious and substantive rather than this kind of, uh, you know, empty, you know, rabbinical, you know, uh, fluff that seemed to be what the, constituted Jewish life in, in most places. Were you enrolled in the joint program? No. That was a, a big thing. In other words, I, I went to, you know, with the this training program in Ramah with a lot of students who went to the joint program. And uh, I wanted Columbia. Uh, and it was different. It was you know, Columbia was the Ivy League school, and you took the core curriculum uh, there. And, uh, and they had a real core. Yes, mm. and it was uh, it was a matter of of, uh, of pride and uh, wanting to identify with with the Columbia and. Uh, so I did consider the joint program, even though when I was at Columbia, I took on Sunday and Wednesdays, I would take like two courses a semester 
at JTS during my first mm -hmm. two or three years. And did you go to Columbia knowing that you wanted to major in English, English literature? Not necessarily. I, I, uh, that was just more of a natural thing that I did. Inter vocationally, when I entered, I think I thought that I wanted to become perhaps a rabbi or a Jewish educator. That seemed to be the coolest thing to be. But that fell by the wayside pretty quickly. And, uh, why? Why? Yeah. I you don't know. So much in your life seems to yeah. actually Yeah, well, it wasn't, it was, it, that not that I was such a cool person, but that was not cool. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, the literature at Columbia, uh, you know, this, there was a whole mystique around uh, uh, literature circles at Columbia and, and the short stories and the poetry being written by, yeah. by, by young writers. Uh, I was very aware of that a number of my teachers were, were New York intellectuals who were writing for commentary and for partisan review. Uh, when we started Response Magazine, we were very aware of Norman Perdard and commentary. At that time, commentary was still liberal left and had switched, but Perdard had gone to Columbia. He had just published the book Making It. It was a piece in the Times. Uh, the Metropolitan section last week about him and that whole, he's in now 88 or something like that, and he's reflecting on, on that. So there was kind of a mystique of the, uh, the great culture that became more attractive and uh, the idea of a life of a rabbi began to seem very uh, parochial. Uh, one interesting thing this week, uh, the day before yesterday, Robert Silvers died. Robert Silver was the longtime editor of the New York Review of Books. And his partner, not life partner, but partner in editing was Barbara Epstein, who died in 2007 or 9 or something like that. That started uh, during, I think, my freshman year of, of college, during the great uh, press strike, where all the newspapers were closed, the New York Review of Books stepped in. Um, and it always seemed like the great life. And when, in 1968, during the, uh, the disturbances at Columbia, the when, strike. pardon? And the great strike. Columbia. Great strike. Uh, I was taking a Shakespeare class, and we didn't. We boycotted the buildings. But our, our professor, Fred Dupuis, took us to Barbara Epstein's apartment for the class, and where a, a group of actors acted some scenes from the plays that, that we were studying. And I remember that to be a very important nexus, not, not that incident, but the idea that there could be some, uh, some, some connection, some permeability between the world that I was inhabiting in Columbia and this world of Irving Howe and uh, Trilling and, uh, and others, and so, that was uh, that seemed to me the the magnet, and so I wanted to do that, but in some Jewish way, which I didn't know how, or but it was it was one of the the models. Percolating there. So as you just mentioned, this was also a time of tremendous social ferment among uh, American youth. Columbia was the site of. Uh, great deal of protest and yes. uh, principled action. O occupations of buildings. The occupation and of the building, the great strike in the spring of 68. Yeah. Um, and you were junior that year, is that right? That Correct. was your junior year. Um, how, how, if at all, did the, did the mood on the campus and the strike affect you personally? <clears throat> I, was, I was very, very confused because I joined others in thinking the war in Vietnam was a terrible thing and I joined others. The, the stuff at Columbia was not just about Vietnam but it was also about the community. The Columbia at that time was going to be taking a piece of Morningside Park and building a gym there and without consulting the community and so forth and that was part of what was going on. So. I felt those issues. And the, that, that 
that Morningside Park was was that part of the um, the African American community? Was it yes, because now it's it's the whole oh. neighborhood's very gentrified around there. But that was a, a tough place to be. You wouldn't go to Morningside Park. Uh, but Columbia was going to build its, build its gym there. Uh, my feeling was that there was this general student uh, sensibility or feeling was kidnapped by SDS, Students for Democratic Society, in order to make the university the proxy for the U.S. government. And that you know, to hold up, to extort the university for what were essentially the sins of the government, whereas the university was the agent of reason and not, not the enemy. So I felt as a liberal kind of uh, mugged by, by the left and uh, being forced into this kind of either or, you either... Had you been involved with... Uh, with the left at all in any kind of activity? Not in, not in, not in formal activities, particularly. I mean, in Response Magazine, we had you know, discussed the war, and I'd written uh, an article about uh, how you know, the sons and daughters of Jewish suburbia could use their bona fides there to go back to their communities and speak about the war and so forth. But I was not, uh, not, not directly involved uh, in that. Um, and in general, when it came to the counterculture and both the political and cultural side of it, I was looking for ways in which this could be authentically connected to the Jewish experiences and values that I felt were, were crucial. I was looking, looking for bridges all the time. In other words, ways in which the, the good things, the enduring parts of the, the counterculture could be appropriated and, and brought into de democratized to improve uh, core Jewish institutions. So your, your, one, your primary lens for sort of engaging with this seems to have been still with, with a Jewish brain. Yes, I think I was uh, not quite aware of it at the time, but very much of a Jewish nationalist in the sense of identifying myself with the fortunes of the Jewish people. So at the same time, the Six Day War had taken place, right. um, must have been the end of your sophomore year. Right. And you had spent time, obviously, in Israel. All of this catapulted Israel to the forefront of American Jewish consciousness. But not to my consciousness. Not to yours. Why was that? Uh, <clears throat> not yet, at least. I, because I was, the, the kind of congregational Judaism that I've been involved in really was about uh, mitzvot as you know, symbolic affirmations of different values. It was about uh, you know, prayer. It was about Torah study. The visceral connection to Israel and to the Jewish people is not there. Not there, at least in the way in which I drank it in. Do you have any recollections of how you felt in the aftermath of the war or during the war? Yeah, well, I felt... Uh, it, it kind of washed over me because I was involved in my own personal, you know, romantic breakups and... and uh, uh, it was, we, we marked it certainly at Ramah uh, that summer, and I had a roommate who went to Israel and volunteered. Never occurred to me to do that. Uh, that would have been, um, would have required a kind of readiness to kind of leave the, the frameworks that were comfortable to me. And I didn't, that was, I think, Part of the big growth of my Jewishness f from around that time on, maybe between 67 and 73, was making that connection and uh, experiencing myself not simply as somebody who had a particular variety of religious Jewish identity and connection to Jewish texts, but also as somebody who was 
a, a citizen of the Jewish people and identify with its history, began to have much more connections with the Russian juries. Uh, not that I was so active, but it wasn't so much on my uh, on my screen. And Israel as well was their connected family in Israel, but not. Uh, I met people later from the Zionist youth movements, for whom this was their you know, end all and be all. But it was for me, it was it was an encounter with some with something that was not me, that that became very interesting. Uh, Rabbi Benzion Gold, who, as we were talking earlier, was the director of Harvard Hillel at this time, uh, in an article on religion on campus in the 60s, wrote that uh, faith in what he, he called a civic religion was shattered during that decade, because of, during the 60s, because of the Vietnam War, because of the Civil Rights Movement, counterculture movement in general. And at the same time, he found that this period also saw a new pride in diversity that celebrated different lifestyles and religions. Now, he wasn't alone in this, but I'm curious how you would describe what it was like being a Jew at Columbia during this period. And to what extent were you involved in Jewish life on campus, to the extent that there was Jewish life on well, campus? Well, the answer is that, uh, that I was something of a Murano. In other words, my Jewish life was lived through my associations with the people who I knew through Ramah, over Shabbat, and we'd get together, uh, and through the summers, and through courses I took at JTS. But it was highly bifurcated. In other words, my connection to Columbia and my studies had very little, uh, very little demonstrably Jewish about me in that. And that had to do with my own inhibitions. In other words, kids I knew who were, let's say, grew up in the boroughs in New York, and I was not a New York kid, and it was, to me, for me to meet them was very different, who were recognizably ethnic. And that was part of them. The, I admired that, and they had an easier time because they were who they were. But especially because of this, this kind of aspirations to be involved in literature and English and things like that, the norms there were very, uh, you know, Anglo-Saxon, waspy on the one hand, and very, to the degree to which it was New York, uh, worldly, cosmopolitan. Um, so I was uncomfortable with my Jewishness in that setting. And I, I you know, uh, when I got older, say I went on for an MA and PhD in English at Columbia, right. and I was going through a lot of changes at that time. But for me, the two were experienced separately, and uh, yeah. ultimately that became unacceptable to me, but it was the norm for a long time. Okay. And did your involvement with in response, the Response, response Magazine, right. affect how you experienced yourself as a Jew and interacted with all these many different types of well, it, experiences? Well, it was, was not a Columbia thing. In other words, it was the... Yeah. It was uh, people from various campuses, right. uh, so it, it didn't contribute to a kind of integration mm -hmm. there. It was important as uh, the beginnings of creating a Jewish counterculture that was very attentive to what was happening in the, in the larger counterculture. I was always trying to understand what does this mean for us. Yeah. But I didn't, I didn't put them together in my life too much later. Yeah. So you graduated from Columbia in 69, your undergraduate degree, and um, by that point it sounds like you decided to go on in English. Right. Ideas of being a rabbi had long since vanished. They had, right. Vanished. Right. right, for the time, yeah, yes. How, what was, how would you describe your Jewish identity at that point? Uh, Well, for, for me, for, from junior high school onward, the, the decision to, to observe Shabbat was, you know, really foundational in terms of how my time was structured and who I spent time with as well. So I, continue, I was observed Shabbat. I, Throughout this whole period, you observed yeah, Shabbat. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, sometimes more passively than actively, but... 
uh, and uh, never felt it as a uh, big renunciation. Felt that I, I, I gained that that something was. Uh, I'm actually trying to think about like my senior, junior, senior year, and it's less distinct to me mm -hmm. than earlier times. I wasn't so much taking courses at the seminary at that time. Uh, I was involved with response. It, the the events at, at Columbia in '68 were took up a lot of oxygen yeah. in in the atmosphere, and uh, and then during the senior year, this, these ideas about starting the Havara were percolating already, and I think I was poised in in, in that in that direction. So before we get to that, I wanted to just ask you about uh, your relationship to the draft. Ah. 69 was, yeah. many things were happening, the lottery was instituted in December of 69, so this was just after you graduated, yes. and many young men were very anxious about I'm glad you I'm glad you asked about it. Um, I, like everybody else, was very anxious about it. Uh, I had, uh, I'd begun to see a psychotherapist through the Columbia counseling services when I was a senior because of a bad romantic breakup. And I asked the therapist I eventually saw to write some something about me that would have the possibility of getting me a psych, you know, some kind of psychiatric deferment. And I had purpose? I mean, with that in mind? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you're saying. Yeah. yeah no, it, 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 there was no other reason for it. And, yeah, that's, I and, just wanted to be And good. The, the note he wrote, you know, maybe sounds as if I was suicidal, he, he cranked it up to, uh, to do the job. And I had, I remember the, uh, the month or so after I graduated college, I went back to Worcester and I was called to uh, induction. Worcester didn't have, didn't have its own induction center. We had to go to Springfield, Massachusetts. It was a very surreal experience. Because all these kids I hadn't seen since high school, I went to a, a general high school with college tracking. So all of these, you know, Armenian, Polish, you know, Greek kids and, you know, Irish are on the bus. I don't know who they were. It left at six in the morning and they couldn't take the toll road, the Mass Pike. It had to go on like Route 20 all the way to Springfield. And I had stayed up the night before so that I would seem like really sleep deprived. And I went through it and I got the, got the deferment. It turned out that I had a very, very high draft number in the 300s, so it was... You would have been okay anyway. Yes, uh, but, uh, but that's the story. Yeah. Okay, so now let's turn to how you became involved in the New York Cover Band and your experience there in the early years. So, as you were starting to say, it was founded in the fall of 69. Um, can you tell me um, when and how? the ideas for this new community started to take shape? I remember a, uh, uh, the, the presence of a, a man named Eugene Wiener uh, being important. Eugene Wiener was, uh, he'd gone to Columbia, he was a native of Florida. He uh, went, was a rabbi from the seminary who had had a congregation in, in, in Canada and then came back to, to New York to get a doctorate in sociology and worked at JTS as the director of the Lieberman Center or something like that at, at the time. Was it an ethics center or something like right, that? Right, right. Yeah. And uh, he was doing that because he wanted to make Aliyah and with an academic degree to begin a, a job teaching sociology there. And he was friendly, I'm not sure from where, I think maybe from Camp Ramon, Glens Bay or something, with Peter Geffen and John Rusquet. And we were, uh, I knew them from USY, and I think they were, they each spent a year in rabbinical school at, at JTS around that time. And so we began talking about these things. And uh, Jean, who was about to go to Israel the next year, was always a big thinker and a big talker as well. And uh, we also read, as a, in, as a text that inspired us, a book by Jacob Neusner that was about early rabbinic fellowship. As we were talking about the end of the Second Temple period, 
temple was destroyed in 70 CE, and the, the early Pharisees, the Prushim, before the temple was destroyed, wanted to have rituals of holiness, not just in the temple, but also in ordinary daily life in their homes. So they began to have uh, kind of fellowships in which they would eat together and, and uh, teach and you know, uh, recite blessings. And uh, Nusner wrote about this, and he used the term Havara. And uh, where had that term come from? I think from these early writings. I think, yeah, I think that's where it came from. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. I don't know how it, how art got to it. Whether these are parallel or or similar things. I mean, I also had some involvement with Art Green and. Uh, uh, starting the group in Boston. I don't remember how that happened so much. It's just that I knew him and I was friendly with him. And uh, uh, So had you been to visit Chavra Chalam, which been, was, had just been founded? Yes, I had been, yeah. Mm -hmm. When it was still in Cambridge before it moved to right, Sanderville. the very first year. Right. Um, I think Art had just gotten married also mm -hmm. during that year. I remember going up for that reason. And, you know, there are people who say that I was uh, in some way important to the idea of the Havara in Boston. I don't remember how. I, I, I just, oh, yes, because you and Barry Holtz, I think, had yes, a conversation. But, yeah, and I don't quite remember, remember it's, it's, that. It's an origin story. It's right, one of the right, origin right, stories, right. yes. Uh, but I remember the uh, being very aware of what Art, Art was doing and, and trying to think about what part of that we wanted and what part of it we didn't. And here's an interesting piece, and I do want to hear more about that. In the Chavarat Shalom origin story, you, at least in this version, you suggested to, I think it was to Barry, that he talk to his good friend Art Green about starting a seminary because uh -huh. Barry was about to graduate from college and needed uh -huh. a, a deferment. Uh -huh. Before. That's probably what happened. I thank you for reminding me of it, but mm -hmm. it's not uh, not sharp in my mind. In the thinking about the New York cover yeah. was there consideration in any way of starting an alternative seminary, or was that not part of it? I think it was. I think there are people who remember that better, but yes, uh, there was, and, uh, and also that it was going to help people with deferments. In the end, I think only one or two people avail themselves of that, and uh, they were people who didn't stay with the group. It was more of an you know, opportunism on their part. So what kinds of ideas were being floated around uh, in well, the early thinking? You know, I think, I think it had to do with some idea of kind of total community. What, what should a community be? A community of people who were shared your values who you uh, had prayer with, uh, that you engaged in study with, and in which you uh, also engaged in political action. And uh, the key thing was face-to-face -face interaction in small settings, as opposed to the congregations that we knew, uh, a community in which would be uh, truly egalitarian, and in, I'm speaking not so much in terms of gender, as in terms of, you know, uh, rabbi, non-rabbi, you know, lay, that those... those the status issues you've been talking about, hierarchies within the yes, community. Yes, yes, very much so. And uh, that it would be a community of people engaged in discussing, you know, important things that are really important to them, and Jewish things and other things, okay. and where where friendship, worship, study, some kind of social action would be uh, all kind of constellated, uh, you know, in, in a community, you know, responsibility for each other. Um, was there, was this meant to take place largely in New York City? Is there talk, I understand, about the possibility of purchasing a more rural property. There was it. There was at the beginning, and I remember 
driving around with Jean and Peter someplace in Westchester, I think maybe in Golders Bridge or some someplace where there was, uh, you know, camps or ha large houses or estates that were being, you know, deaccessioned or something like that. Uh, yeah, or or some kind of multi-level brownstone in New York as well as, you know, those are very ambitious plans that never, you know, never happened. But uh, and why did they never happen? Was it basically financial or something else? I don't. I don't know. I. I don't. Um, I assume when push came to shove, there would have been you know big real estate things and that, and that uh, we weren't. Nobody was in that position, you know. Or, but so, I don't remember. So ultimately, the group rented a. An apartment on West 99th Street, I understand? Yes, I think that was the first, probably, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and, and pe people lived there also, I mean, Michael Strat. It, that was the Strasfels apartment, huh. that's what it was, it was Strasfels apartment, and they moved to 101st Street here, Drew Brownstone here, and I think we took over that apartment, and Jerry Serrata lived there for some time. And uh, I don't know if anybody else did. I can't remember. Yeah. As you were saying uh, a few minutes ago, you, you were very aware of Haber Shalom, as were others. Mm -hmm. To what extent were you all influenced by the ways in which Haber Shalom was developing its ideas and evolving as you were thinking mm -hmm. about it and getting the New York cover off the ground? Not so much, is my feeling about it. Uh, there weren't that many personal bridges. In other words, my relationship to Art and to Barry and, and people like that. Uh, but, you know, uh, John Ruskay, Peter Geffen, others, I don't think particularly were connected. And they weren't so much attracted to the... Uh, the central role of religious experience that, that was really at the heart of uh, Havrat Shalom. Uh, they, you know, they each had their own issues with, with Judaism and they were very much in favor, but, but I would say not interested in a kind of consistent application nor of a kind of real experiential, uh, countercultural kind of re-understanding of, the, of their, their Judaism. I'm not saying that I was necessarily about all, all those things, but uh, but I don't think I don't think Chavarat Shalom had a had a kind of shimmer for them that was that was uh, that wasn't the personal connection and it wasn't that kind of religious inwardness was not what uh, was being looked for. So yeah. it's, uh, you, you, can't, you can't really think of how the New York cover on my mind as a, uh, you know, a delayed offshoot. Right. So the original descriptive brochure for the New York cover stated, quote, free from ties with other institutions, the cover will aim to create a new kind of religious leadership for the Jewish community and to serve as a model for a new form of Jewish life. Mm -hmm. what, what was driving the desire for a, a new kind of religious leadership and, and, a, and a vision for a new kind of Jewish life? You know, it's brochure speak. You know, we have to understand that and uh, I think the desire for a new kind of leadership was a leadership that would be, you know, uh, uh, you know, less aloof and less uh, uh, more connected to people, would be much better informed about uh, the sources of Jewish life than Jewish leaders, not rabbis so much, but people who are organizational leaders. This is a time when most Jewish organizations, especially federations, we're completely disconnected from what we think of Judas, as Judaism. So that was part of the critique as well. And, and we should get around to 
what else was happening in, in 69, 70 with the occupation of the Federation building mm -hmm. here, in which I was very important as not a Chavara activity, but something that was aligned, I think represented the spirit of the times as well. Right. So uh, We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Um, so much, much of the disenchantment of the original members, many of whom were, were seminary students and even seminary faculty, um, at faculty? faculty? Well, like, like, was well, I don't know if he's faculty, but like Rabbi Wiener. Um, yeah, that, but, but then he left, he was not part of it. So mainly oh, okay. seminary students, um, some, yeah. as well as some others, you know, had to do with the JTS model of uh, rabbinic education. Right. Um, yeah. Did you, have, did you have thoughts about that model of education? Well, not as much as they did, because I was not uh, affected by it in the same way. In other words, if they were rabbinical students, they were involved in a vocational, professional setting right. where they, the, what, the way they were studying had very little to do with the kinds of Jewish leaders they wanted to become, by which I mean that, that the courses were highly academic and many of them were run on a kind of a the more, more of a 19th century model of uh, studying manuscripts and philology, of, of the science of Judaism, Wissenschaft des Judentums, and uh, weren't answering the, the deeper existential questions about Judaism. It was very disconnected from what they thought the agenda was. Uh, it wasn't so much the case for me. When I took courses as an undergraduate at Columbia, I learned a lot. I mean, the courses in Hebrew literature and Jewish history. And at Columbia or even at JTS? At J when I was yeah, at Columbia, at Columbia. Columbia right. and so forth. And so for me, JTS was, was not a professional school that crushed the spirit out of aspiring rabbis. For me, it was uh, more positive than that, because I was never in that situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that first fall when, of 69, when yeah. uh, the New York Harbor had just gotten off the ground, Many members of the Chavara uh, took part in uh, the mobilization, the anti-war, anti-Vietnam War demonstration that took place in Washington yeah. in November 1969, called the largest student protest, um, anti-war protest ever held in the United States. Were you part of that? Did you participate in that? I think so. I was at a number of big Washington mm -hmm. marches. I, I think I was there for that as well. Yeah. Although. I don't have that differentiated in my mind from others. I, see. I think it's important to talk about the the uh, the uh, federation uh, yeah, demonstration. Yeah, just talked. just in brief, what it was is that uh, at, at the time the <coughs> the federation was separate from UJ. It was federation, and UJ was something else. To tell well, the, what was the Israel. difference between them at, at that point? Uh, needs abroad and needs in New York. New York Federation was about the needs of New York. And UJA? Was about Israel and, and Jewry abroad okay. as well. So Federation here basically was funding you know, the hospitals and the social, surface, social service networks that once serviced Jews, but now it was more of universalist out, outreach. Mm -hmm. And it had very little connection with Jewish institutions, with Jewish education, with youth on campus, Soviet Jewry, and it was a very kind of German Jews private affair. So uh, this group, and the group, which is important for me to point out, was a co co coalition of leaders from a whole bunch of, of Jewish student groups from the Zionist youth movements. There was also something called the, uh, the Jewish Liberation Network or something. Uh, there were students from YU. I was from, from here. And we had a coalition. I think uh, Stephen Cohen, the sociologist, was involved in it as well. And our, our demand was that the Federation open its books and become transparent and democratic, but also that it begin to fund Jewish education, that it should fund uh, Soviet jury efforts, and uh, it, it should see Jewish students on campus as part of its responsibility as well. Uh, in other words, be Jewish. Uh, 
and what we did was to uh, get up very early one morning, go into the Federation building on 59th Street, and took over the building, took over the switchboard, and took it over, and, uh, and, uh... How many people were involved in this? Probably 20 or something, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, and I think I was the chair of it. I think I was the coordinator. Uh, because the only time I got my picture in the paper was on the front of the Morgan Journal uh, after that. And uh, the police called in and took us away. And it was, uh, it was an important moment. It was important because it had some real symbolic value. And, you know, Federation was probably going to be pushed in those directions anyway, but they began to do a lot of things. I'm not saying because of that day, but there was, and, uh, and it was a great deal of fun. It was really uh, a sense of, you know, of, 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 of potency, really, of being able to do something. And uh, doing it, the whole notion is by being stronger Jews, we could leverage and show this federation to be uh, pallid and uh, unserious and so forth. So it wasn't so much of, of, of destroying the adults, but it was holding them to account for what we, what we thought were the, the core values of, of what should be due to the Jewish community. So, uh, did anything change or begin to change as a result? It did, it did, it did. I mean, they, uh, again, I am it's not necessarily because of that event, but one thing is that they begin the Federation began to establish a large fund for funding Hillel's and Jewish activities and established a commission. And I was co opted to be you know, on that for several years. Steve Cohen uh, was as well, and uh. Eventually, various commissions within Federation were established for you know, Jewish education. And for so, uh, yes, I mean, it's, uh, it, it was a, you know, a bump in that direction. And it sounds empowering for it certainly, a group of young people. Yes, it felt that way. It felt like, I don't know, to try to get the right register of of being naughty and acting out, but because you're authorized by what are the real values of the community rather than the sham values that were being represented by the organizations. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. So I want to transition a little bit to, to just, talk. Just, Jane, just sure. I, the addendum to that is that for me, it was, it was important for my Jewish identity because I was branching out beyond this kind of, uh, you know, religious synagogue background and encountering people from the whole range of, you know, from, you know, uh, left-wing Zionist youth movements, the whole spectrum. And their cultures are very different and uh, really interesting to me as well. It was part of my kind of turning out toward the Jewish world generally from what had been a, a rather cloistered background. Was that partly through the network that was um, of Jewish youth organizations that yes. was established yeah. in that church? Can yeah. you talk about that a little bit? I, I'm not a great source for it. I mean, it's, it's something I got to know those people. I, I, I hung out with them. Um, they were responsible for a series of conferences that were important, and one at Starlight, Pennsylvania, that uh, must have been the summer of 71 mm -hmm. or 2, uh, that, that had the effect of uh, broadening the impact of kind of a Jewish counterculture, you know, more broadly. Mm -hmm. And uh, they got connected to the, uh, you know, the summer Havara. Uh, the Institute? The Institutes and things like that. Later. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So I'm saying it's part of Mm -hmm. uh, part of that, but it, 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 the network thing was more of a kind of a Jewish student movement right. that would have you know uh, people loosely affiliated in different campuses. Right, but as you say, involved with many different aspects of Jewish life, not right. just religious. Right, and for me, that was the important thing that it was a 
a broadening of my horizons. Yeah, it's very important. So to look at, I want to look at um, the New York cover art from several different angles. Um, the first being community, because many people point to community as being the very heart of what yeah. the Chavara endeavor was about. Um, can you just try and articulate for a minute what, um, what was most appealing to you personally about the vision for uh, community that the Chavara was? Well, I, th I think when you use the word community, you also have to think about surrogate family or ersatz family. In other words, the I viewed myself as, kind of, as somewhat representative, generationally, of people who were distant from their parents. I, mean, I had good relations with my parents, but I was not close to them. And my desire in high school was to, you know, get to New York and make a life for myself. Um, I did not have a, a wide family network that I was that was part of my life. I moved away from my family geographically, uh, and so I wanted to distance myself. But at the same time, it meant that the needs for connection were. Uh, Underserved because of the kind of somewhat emotionally isolating path, and uh, again, I'm not, there, everybody's many different people, very many different paths, uh, but I think it's true for a certain number of people that uh, they wanted kind of a new kind of. Uh, family configuration that, again, we were largely unmarried. It was, it was some married, married couples. There was also, I think, a belief in the possibility of friendship, a friendship that was not simply buddies, but a friendship that was somewhat intentional, a part of a community that brought with it uh, practically that you see people on a fixed basis and you, you know, you view them as, uh, you know, as fellows. Uh, so it, it was a place, in, in part, a place for me to be that gave me a uh, connection uh, that would have been maybe hard for me to make on my own, and which I had renounced by distancing myself from my family. Um. How did the founding group uh, go about identifying, identifying and finding members, new members, um, as the Hubbard was getting started? And, and what yeah. was the process of becoming a member? I don't remember the, the, you know, the, uh, the diffusion or dissemination, how we got this around. What I do remember is a lot of debates about admissions, about selectivity, and, and what... Uh, uh, you had to be admitted. Uh, so one of the primary critiques of Chavarot in general, particularly New York Chavarot and Chavarot Shalom in those early years was, yeah. you know, so-called elitism characteristic of the yeah. admissions process. So yeah. can, you, can you talk about what you recall of what, what, what those debates were, what the criteria were, how people got chosen to become part of or not um, in those early well, you know, this is, I'm dredging, you were dredging things up. I, I recall... I'm trying my best. I know, I know. <laughs> Stirring the pot. Uh, I think it had to do with, you know, like-mindedness about Jewish observance and study and... Uh, but there was also, so what do you do with whether you don't like somebody? And there was the term of kind of like, you know, some kind of gross personality defect or something. Should that be a legitimate criterion if you really felt that somebody was, you know, not pleasant to be with, and you know, uh, that being debated? Um, 
I remember a lot of talk about it, but very little um, putting it into practice. Uh, in the end, I think people who really wanted to be were there, and and others weren't. But it was people who were, you know, were doing something like they were, you know, a rabbinical student at HUC, or they were um, involved in, in the Jewish community in in, in some way. Um, but I don't remember a lot more about that, and I don't, I don't remember instances of people who really wanted. The, 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 the problem was with people who wanted draft deferment and really didn't buy into the program. And there were, there were a couple of people like that. And there was tension around that because, you know, then you really had to kind of talk to them about a kind of, you know, contractual agreement to do this and that. And then they wouldn't do it. And then, you know, just. Yeah. So, how would you describe the people who were part of the, you know, in, the, in those early days, in terms of who they were, what their backgrounds were, I think there, I think there were a lot of people who were who had backgrounds in in Rama and conservative Judaism, one sort or another. Mm -hmm. uh, not everybody. Some through the Reform movement, but. I can't think of that many people who, who weren't uh, really exposed and involved to Jewish life you know, beforehand. Mm -hmm. uh, Would you say that there was a certain political orientation that people tended to have? Well, but it was a political orientation that was, you know, what grew on the shrubs at the time, in other words, which was, uh, you know, anti-establishment, anti-war. Uh, but certain, but rarely uh, defined in terms of particular politics. John Muscat perhaps was the most political, and he had had some involvement with SDS when he was at the University of Pittsburgh, and and was the veteran of you know late night uh, you know, sessions of sorting out ideological stuff. It was not so much the norm. Uh, I, I think I don't remember if there's anybody who had like a conservative, more right wing in orientation, not that I can think of. Mm -hmm. But again, these were the times. This was uh, this was Columbia, the West Side. It was mm -hmm. you didn't need a uh, you know kind of a Trotskyite, anti-Trotskyite, you know cookie cutter kind of thing. It was not. Uh, well, Jews, Jew, Jewish students were certainly disproportionately. Uh, represented in the civil rights movement and other protest movements yeah, yeah. of the day, people who got involved with the New York Havara and the other Havarot, would you say it's fair to say that they were looking for a way to bring their their political activism and their Jewish identities and activism as Jews. I think it's, it's true for the New York Havara, not, not so much for the Boston Havara, although there were individuals there. But our uh, personality was more turned to the world in that way. But again, it, was about, it wasn't so much about acting in the, in the outside non-Jewish world. It was more about bringing those values into the Jewish community and its institutions. I mean, um, I can see, as can be seen by the subsequent careers of you know, a number of right. individuals. What was the policy towards admission of women in the New York Hamra at this point, early on? I don't think there was a separate policy as far as I remember. Were women yeah. well represented in these early, early uh, years? You know, I, I don't. Not not uh, not on a one to one basis, but like you know Paula, uh, Paul Hyman and uh, Martha Ecclesburg and Liz Colton, and Leslie Shankin were you know in there from the beginning pretty much. Yeah. Uh, others as well. Mm -hmm. um, but but as you know from doing this that the the group Ezrat Nashim was something of a break off from New York Havara, which became its own thing. Right. 
and uh, as for other things, right? Other things. And I know that subsequently there were retrospective critiques of the New York Havara uh, from that perspective. Um, so, uh, when the New York cover up began and rented this apartment in the West 1909, um, served as a central meeting place. Right. Can you just describe what that space was like and how the, the apartment functioned in the life of the community? It, it had a central living room and a bedroom on each side and a kitchen and a kind of a foyer area. So small. Yeah, and I think I think Jerry Serrata lived in one room, and, and then the, the main room was used for our weekly meetings, and for Shabbat morning services, episodically, and also for uh, for study groups as well. I, th I think a key thing you may want to get into this separately is what characterized their cover off. Uh, especially was our monthly retreats. Right, right. And that was really different, uh, different in part because we were an urban group. Right. And uh, early on, from the very first year, the idea of spending one uh, Shabbat a month in the country somewhere was pretty strongly rooted right. and last, lasted for a long time. Uh, where would you go, and how, who, how would you find these places to go? We would, it was, some of it was camps mm -hmm. that you know, weren't being used during the winter. Uh, occasionally, you know, uh, some large country house of somebody's if we could get that, but there were more camps. And so we would you know, use one for a bunch of times till that wasn't available any, anymore. And they were usually, you know, at least two hour drives. And, uh, it was really getting out of the city. It was in all climates, the winter as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so th there, in a certain way, there was the more intense community because it wasn't just, you know, we had, we had a, a weekly meeting, a meal and a meeting together. Right. But this was the whole time together. And uh, that was more the crucible of what kind of Jewish community we're going to be. So what kind of community well, was it? Well, you know, that's the thing. In other words, the uh, hanging out, uh, a lot of time to be with each other and take walks and so forth. But the question was, what would be the formal Jewish components? Right. Friday night, Saturday morning, study, uh, the meals themselves, and the very fact of Sabbath observance. In other words, you can't get during the winter, two hours away from New York on a short Friday without leaving early on Friday. And not everybody did. So this was a group in which there was always you know, the Shabbos car that made it its point to get there earlier and set things up. But then in the winter, most people came after Shabbat. So this is, I think, really interesting I mean, from my point of view because of the, the range of practical observance. You get there, you know, you want a fire in the fireplace. Very serious transgression of Shabbat. So I think things went back and forth to that. People who, you know, didn't mind and people who minded a great deal. And then there's a question of, uh, the question of kosher was not an issue, kosher, but uh, usually there was, uh, you know, chicken and some kind of you know, veggie option. Uh, but obviously we had the openness to use the, uh, you know, the surfaces and kitchen facilities of the camps. But it, it was in part about, about services. It was the idea of, of having a serious davening was something that was raised a lot of ambivalence for a lot of people. And uh, so there was always a tension of, well, Shabbat morning after people are getting up late, there's going to be davening. And, uh, but it was always the core people to whom it was very important trying to involve the people who weren't, who were being annoyed that they're not participating or talking. And th this was a, a source of uh, frustration to me all along, because I had assumed that the social compact 
in this community was that we were going to be an observant community and uh, we would not observe things that we decided not to on, the, on some kind of principled basis because they were objectionable to us or right. things having to do with women and so forth. But it, it took me many years to be disabused of the fact that there was no such compact and that it just wasn't that important to many people. And Dominating Dominating. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some people it was, many people it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And so, what was important to those other people? Uh, well, study was more acceptable, and uh, some kind of text study. Why, why did you use the word acceptable? Uh, I noticed my using that as well. Because it's, it raised fewer hackles in people who had some issues from their childhood or theologically with, with prayer. But study is study, you know, and, and it involves discussion. And so that was much more, was much more buy-in uh, around that. In terms of who was present at these retreats, was it members only or members plus their significant others or were... Yeah, significant others were fine and there would be occasionally some, you know, uh, outliers who would come, people who weren't formally members, but people were comfortable with. I wanted about to go back to the issues of ritual. Mm. A very uh, distinct memory I have from the first retreat we had uh, was, I think it was lunch on Shabbat, and we were finished eating, and I said, I kind of like banged on the table and said, let's bench. And all of a sudden, everyone looking at me as if I had presumed to carry over a tradition that I took for granted rather than opening up for questioning about whether we should. And that was, uh, I got a bit pounded. Uh, but it was an interesting, interesting moment, interesting also diver divergence against, but again between my conception of what the compact was and, and uh, what, it was. what it was in other people's mind. Yeah. What would happen in an instance like that? What did happen? Well, we ended up doing the kind of zone. After a discussion? Uh, of some sort, yeah. Of some sort. Yeah. Did that discussion, however, affect subsequent retreats and whether you did beer kind of subsequent we, we, sort of gatherings or we, communal we, gatherings or not? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm tentatively remembering, you can, you can check out with other people, mm -hmm. that when we had these Thursday evening meals, I don't think we did work. During time. the week? Yeah, I don't think we did right. work. So, the, so just to sort of recap for, us for a minute, so there were the monthly retreats, which were these really intensive community mm -hmm. building opportunities, as you were saying. Yeah. But other, in addition to that, there were a weekly meal yeah, the, the, and meeting. Yeah, that was important as well. And that was Thursday evenings. Yeah, Thursdays. and people would take responsibility for you know, the meal. So and someone all. would cook, bring food and cook? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, and for a program also, which could be on an issue, it could be inviting a guest to speak mm -hmm. with us. Mm -hmm. So uh, Was it also sometimes a meeting to discuss community issues or how are we going to deal with this issue or that issue, kashrut, or I mean, like benching or any other kinds of issues that might come up. I remember less of that, but mm -hmm. I assumed it should have, but it's not mm -hmm. present in my mind so much. Do you remember any of the kinds of programs that would take place? No, not not so much. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had various guests. We had Shlomo Kalbach visit once. So mm. We had somebody come to poetry another time. Mm. Um, was there really lively conversation there? Yeah. So there was discussion was yes. was key, yeah. and you know many people remember the New York cover as the one with quote the really good food. Does that ring a bell? Well. I mean, I think that in, in Chavrat Shalom, everything must have been vegetarian all the time. It's largely. Yeah. Not always, yeah. but largely. And Probably because of Everett in the early years. Right. Yeah. We were more varied. I, I don't think of it now as being, I think it's being 
you know, substantial, mm -hmm. but not, uh, maybe more robust, but, but not, uh, okay. not in the Feinschmecker category. Yeah. Um, and within the Chavarot community, the New York Chavarot community, did people also get involved in inviting each other to their homes for, say, Shabbat meals? Or other other meals, or was it mainly the, the weekly communal meal, meal that was the the glue? I think it's the second. Um, I think there was socializing. Not everybody did, you know, Shabbat meals, uh, right. you know, as a thing. Uh, um, So you wouldn't necessarily, you're saying, spend Friday night dinner or with with other members of the Chavarot. Not, not, but not, not, you know, necessarily a right. way of, you know, branching out having connections with other people as well. Why do you think the uh, the New York Chavarot didn't get involved in 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 doing um, Shabbat services, for instance, on a more regular basis? We did have them at the 99th uh, mm -hmm. Street apartment. That still sounds like they were more sporadic, not Yes, like that's right. Mm -hmm. It had to do with the, uh, the interests of, of, of individuals. There, there weren't that many people for whom, you know, being someplace Shabbat morning in Shul was really important to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also had a couple of people like uh, uh, Sugarman, I forget his first name, Alan Sugarman, who had had, this is really a minority, had a serious yeshiva background and was so ambivalent about it that it was very hard for them to, to relate to it. That was just, just, just a few people. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, my... Uh, One of my issues with Havra all along was along these questions of, of seriousness about about certain ritual things that you know I was operating on the basis of we were doing the mitzvot except for when we took issue you know with things and that there, there, there was a basically halachic approach in the sense of of commitment to a set of you know practices and. Uh, I always felt, you know, like the, you know, the, the frumster there, and uh, which I didn't particularly enjoy being. Although I don't know if I would have enjoyed being the liberal outlier in a, you know, in a front group of people doing a lot more than me. And I had my own, you know, needs to uh, to feel uh, that I was upholding kind of the standards rather than. But um, yeah, I mean, I think for many other people. The, the social solidarity to precedence over any particular Jewish uh, practice. Yeah. We had just been starting to talk about prayer as a central activity for the Havarat. And as you've been saying, in your personal life, you had a very strong interest in prayer and observance, and that that wasn't universally so within the early Havarat. Um, how, how would you describe the attitudes towards tefillah in general among, um, within the Chavara as it was getting started? The New York Chavara. Yeah, the New York Chavara. Uh, uh, dutiful, casual, um, uh, appropriate on Shabbat. Meaning what? When, when, we had, uh, when we were together for Shabbat, the idea that there wouldn't be services would would, uh, but the the desire to intensively participate was was not so strong. I mean, here's a good place to com you know contrast us with Chavarot Shalom in Boston because uh, that was a group which you know it hardly needs saying was constellated around a central personality for whom spirituality was central, many other things as well. Uh, and uh, that attracted 
uh, a kind of like-minded group of people who, for whom uh, a spiritual practice as a larger category, which, in, in, which involves services in the sense of statutory prayers, prayers that have to be said at a certain time, was part of the deal, but maybe as a subset of a larger uh, absorption in, in, a, in a spiritual dimension. Uh, the, the individuals involved in your Chavara did not, it was not part of their repertoire particularly. Uh, it just was not so important to them. And, and I, I want to be clear about my own situation. In other words, I you know, felt that, uh, you know, th that regular prayer is important and to be done correctly with seriousness and so forth. But I also didn't share the degree of um, priority and preciousness that was part of the, the norm in Havarat Shalom. I would have been something of an outlier there. And I often think of it, you know, in, in terms of conventional uh, terms of, uh, of my being, uh, being a Litvak in origin from Lithuania. In other words, there's something temperamentally in me that uh, is consoled and finds meaning in regular prayer, but it is, does not incline toward mystical uh, absorption. Would you, do you think of yourself as a, as a spiritual seeker? I never, never use that term about myself. Okay. No. Uh, no, I found, you know, <laughs> I found my groove, <laughs> and I'd like it to be meaningful and, and you know, uh, kept relevant and so forth. But uh, for me, let's say the forms of Jewish prayer, the Siddur, are, are not um, just spiritual hooks, but rather they're the real thing. And it's, they should be the objects of our uh, making them useful and good to us. But they're not like just stepping stones along the way to some kind of path to enlightenment. It's not. Yet yeah, you describe at least once uh, tefillah, the experience of tefillah at <coughs> the Nura Kabara as kind of schleppy, quote unquote. Yes, there weren't, you know, so many of us who were graced with uh, a large repertoire of skills. We didn't really develop them that much. Uh, there were those of us who would have done well if there had been better leaders, and better leaders than those people with, with uh, could do it better, yeah. so forth. And uh, there are people, you know, people like Peter Geffen, who were very good voice and trained in it, but for him, it kind of seemed to be kind of associated with his performance as a you know U.S. wire and things like that. And it wasn't something that he wanted to uh, you know take take the lead in. So we didn't we didn't do it well, and there wasn't quite enough interest in it. Yeah. Many people point to the creative tension between tradition and innovation as being hallmarks of prayer within the early cover road. Is that true of the New York cover as well? To, yes, to the degree to which we were serious about doing it. There were experiments of, uh, of having you know, prayer services where certain themes were emphasized and there would be some kind of preamble or kavana trying to focus people and then... Can you think of an example or two of a theme? No, I can't right now. Okay. Uh, but uh, it didn't go too much beyond that. It wasn't in the area in which whatever creativity we had was deeply invested. Mm -hmm. um, were Reb Zalman or Karl Bach, others um, like that, uh, significant? Within the new cover up, no, no. Nigunim, Nigunim, yeah, as a resource, we were aware of them, and Nigunim were. But uh, and I remember uh, we once invited Shlomo Kalbach to come and meet with us on a Thursday night, and he did. And uh, I think we spent most of our time making fun of him afterwards. You know, the kind of uh, you know, self-serious, uh, Yiddishized uh, way of speaking and so forth. It was not. Um, uh, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't there as a kind of 
you know, a teacher, celebrity, that it was more of a curiosity. So spiritual seeking was not a strong, long suit uh, for us. Um, were there any other significant uh, influences on the style of davening or the approach to davening? Um, did, it draw, did the Chabra tend to draw on contemporary sources of poetry or music, those kinds of things? Degree, you know, you're, you're trying to till a uh, furrow here that, that I don't think is very deep with us. But no, I just want to hear no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, not, not that I recall so much. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think whether we did services on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. I think we didn't. I'm not sure. Were, were a number of, of people sort of caught up in obligations towards the seminary or HUC. Uh, did that have any role in why people weren't so interested in being an available on Shabbat morning, for instance? No. No, that wasn't what it was about. No, no, it was just a disinclination to uh, mm -hmm. the obligation to show up. Mm -hmm. uh, was there a Torah reading that was... When you would gather, or no, we'd read from a chumash. I don't think we had a Torah scroll of our own. Okay. So far as I remember, Did people chant or you read or how was how was I how what was the approach? I to think they would they would read. Shot? I think they would read. They'd read. You know, it's you're you're pressing me on 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 things I don't remember well. In part because it was the the kind of the limping aspect of of the okay. community. Yeah. And. Um, you know, Chavrat Shalom evolved as a liturgical community much more than we did. Mm -hmm. And what happened with, later on, with the community I'm now involved with, Minyan Ma'at here, is more the, the kind of serious liturgical side of it, you know, kind of not abstracted, but, you know, this is a community that's not a total community the way Chavrat Shalom, the New York Chavrat was, but it reflects a number of the practices. Um, given all this, it's worth focusing at least briefly on the issue of um, gender and sort of Jewish, the role of Jewish feminism in right. yeah. uh, shaping uh, or influ having an influence on the directions of prayer and liturgy um, in the New York cover up. It's really interesting. Um, I experienced it as we were a totally egalitarian community from, from the get-go. Uh, but that was from my position as a male. And the fact that a certain number of the stronger voices were men. So I'm sure that... Voices as in prayer leaders, you mean? Or voices in the community? In the community, yeah. Um, so I, I was aware in my peripheral vision of a kind of Jewish feminism taking shape. And some of the participants were members of our group that formed Ezra and Nashim. But, uh, but I, I thought of our community as kind of uh, as a level playing ground. Although that was my experience. Did the women who were involved in Ezra and Nashim, who were part of the Nura Kavara, like Martha Applesberg and Liz Colton and other Paul Hyman, um, did they bring these concerns and issues into the Kavara for, for instance, that discussion, either just general discussion as people were together or as the topic of conversation at a communal meeting on a Thursday evening or a retreat? I think we did. I think they did. But I think the the uh, emergence of that separate group became the focus for those discussions. What do you mean? Well, there's the formation of Ezra and Nashim. In seventy one ish. Yeah. Right. Was became the the forum in which the, those issues were were uh, sorted out, and I, I think I think they overflowed into the group as a whole. Uh, That's what I'm trying to. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, that, I'm not sure I can 
uh, be more specific about you, that. In your mind's eye, as you picture yeah. Tula during that period, yeah. are women wearing, do you, were women wearing Tulesing, for instance? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were they um, leaders? Were they, were they serving as Baltfila or what you weren't reading to her? You weren't reading to her. Um, not so much, but I think I think because it wasn't so such a big deal with us, and or it could be simply that the that the practice and the background of the experience wasn't secondhand in that way. But we didn't yeah. we didn't uh, push it at it or or the group and the women in the group did not establish it as an active area that would be, you know, uh, women would grow and learn these things. It was not. Right. To what extent do you think these issues were on the minds of the men in the group in general? Or was it in people's for, for whole vision, mainly? Well, I'll put it negatively. It, it wasn't really put in our face in an aggressive way. So, you know, representing myself, I think we were allowed to feel that we were not the bad guys because we were participating in an egalitarian community. At the same time, I think we were only dimly aware of the, the kinds of discourse we used that uh, probably was experienced as exclusivist. I had an interesting experience uh, maybe about 10, 12 years ago there's a guy who writes for the Times now named, I think it's Hoffman, he's a religion writer, <coughs> who was finishing a dissertation at Yale about different autonomous religious groups comparing the Chavara with other groups. He interviewed me and he told me that Martha Acklesberg remembered some analysis I had done of the, the prayer on Saturday morning that, that introduces the morning service, the Nishmat Kol Chai, and that I described that as a prayer that built to a crescendo that was a kind of orgasm. I, until it's, you know, my body, you know, I'm filled with praise until I can't contain myself anymore. And her telling him of her feeling that I was using a very masculinist uh, image about it. Now, I'm sure it's true, I'm sure also that I had no awareness that uh, that that I was doing so. Yeah. As an example. Interesting. Yeah. Um, the other area that was was really central to um, the New York Kabbara was the dedication to Jewish learning. And that study. Um, the, that original brochure again said study will be central to the life of the Chavara, study conceived as the locus of engagement by the individual and the group with the basic issues in their own lives and in the life of society. How do you think the Chavara sought to turn that vision into practice, both in terms of the content? I don't, I mean, I, I can say what there was and what I participated in. And I'm also interested in, as you're thinking about it, yeah. the, um, the ways in which teaching and learning took place. The yeah, no, that, that, that yeah. was clearly part of it. I mean, the way part had to do with uh, leveling of the, the classroom experience between teacher and student. Mm -hmm. In other words, the idea was that there were some of us who were lucky to have, you know, kind of a, a serious academic knowledge of, of Jewish studies, and they were sharing that with others, and uh, so they were resource persons in a discussion, and, and their authority in terms of knowledge was was, was clearly acknowledged. But uh, that was the that was the great difference, you know, in pedagogy, that these were. Uh, uh, kind of voluntary uh, and collaborative uh, enterprises. And I had some wonderful experiences during the first two or three years 
uh, David Sperling was one of the members. He was married to Phyllis Sperling. They divorced uh, later on. And he was uh, a great student of, of Hebrew Bible with an enormous amount of philological knowledge. And uh, I think during the first year, we had a, uh, there were seven or eight of us who studied Psalms with him, you know, using the Hebrew text. And it was a schlep. We went down to somebody's apartment, uh, Burton Weiss, who was, uh, if that, figure, that name has come up, who uh, lived in, in the West Village, the East Village someplace. And, and uh, we'd uh, and David would know about it, but even would know the text. But it was it was very discussed, and I learned a great deal. And I did, we did, I think, the next year or something on the Genesis narratives with David as well. Um, and what was he doing at that point in his life? At that point, if in his life, <coughs> I think he was finishing his doctorate. He had gone to rabbinical school at the seminary and got a doctorate at Columbia. And then he went to teach at Stony Brook, and they moved out there. But I think they, they I'm not sure where they were living at the time. Uh, so that, that was a very important experience for me. And uh, there was uh, a, a teacher at the seminary named David Wolf Silverman who did a course on the Holocaust that didn't last very long, but it was also important. Um, I think Bob Goldenberg did things, but I can't quite remember what that was. Uh, oh, Gershon Hundert, who was a professor at McGill now, taught a serious course on uh, East European Jewry, Polish Jewry. Taught at his home and had a lot of people also who were close to him. And so there were things like this. And, uh, and were, the stu were the classes for members of the Chavara or also? I think for members people. of the Chavara, yeah. So, so it wasn't open to the public? No, it wasn't a kind of a lairhouse thing so much. I remember another group that wasn't centered around a particular teacher, but it was on interest theology when we read, four or five of us would gather and read Rosenzweig. And, and uh, some of the participants of that were people who were trained in philosophy. So uh, I, I don't think that continued too much for very long. But when it was going, it was, uh, it was very good. How was the roster of courses uh, decided upon? It was really uh, you know, interest who was willing to be if, let's say, if David Sperling was willing to do something and people, there were takers for it, it was, there wasn't a kind of, uh, we're going to decide to address these subjects this year. It was more about the availability of people and what, what certain common interests were. Would it just sort of bubble up through conversation or was there actually a moment that people sat around and <laughs> talked about what, what courses? I, I don't remember, but I assume at the beginning of the year there was a business you know, meeting where we, we sorted that out. Mm -hmm. but I don't have a so how much time would you devote, for instance, in the course of a week to studying in these Havara courses? I would probably typically be involved in two. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think one was often before the meeting Thursday night, like an hour before or something like yeah. that. So oh. it did, didn't involve, I think Gershon's course on Post jury was Sunday afternoons at his house. Uh, the ones with David Sperling that first year, Burton Weiss down in the village was the, the host for it. Yeah. So what was what was your response to studying in this kind of very you know, sort of informal but serious environment? Well, to me it was uh, it was great. I mean, it was it was great uh, be, for the reasons indicated that it. it it, it was it was really Torah Lishma in the sense that there weren't exams or papers that had to be read, that you you know had access to very knowledgeable people, uh, and also that you could the the range of responses that you could have were much wider than you would in a, in a university setting, so you, you could relate it to your own life or 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 be more uh, imaginative. 
So the, Did you teach at all in this context? I don't think so. No. Uh, because don't forget, I was in graduate school in English. Right. No, there's, there wasn't uh, so much a Judaic body of knowledge that I had to offer. So you're saying that people who taught here actually have real expertise in the fields in which yeah. they teach. Yeah. Yeah. And you were very lucky, as you said, to right. have these people with you. And I would say that, that for me, the, that lit a spark about my wanting to be one of those people. Or, or making a journey from English studies into Jewish studies. When did that start to happen? That sense that you wanted to start to think about making it's that a change? very It's a very distinct uh, trajectory. In other words, I began graduate school in, in, in 69, 70. In English? With, with the intention of becoming an English professor? Was that well, what you Well, you know, in those days, you just assume that was it, but you didn't think about it that as a professional training school. And, you know, uh, people who see this in the future will, should know that there was a time where people went to graduate school de rigueur. That's what you did in something or other. Very different from, from now. Uh, a lot of reasons for that. But, uh, so I went because I wanted to continue to study. It was really interesting to me, the idea that this was a, a vocational track toward being an English professor was not, not conceptualized. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, I really liked doing English. It was wonderful. Uh, again, I was, I led a very kind of schizoid life in that, I, that the Jewish dimension of, of my life was not in play and I didn't have a lot of social connections to the students that I was studying with. My social life was more with the Havara and people I knew from, from, from Jewish circles. Because of that experience of uh, the protest at the Federation, kind of widening my experiences to connect more with Zionism, Soviet Jewry, and experience of studying Jewish texts, the, when it came time for my doctoral exams uh, at Columbia, I was beginning to feel that this was actually real, that you're supposed to kind of go and do, have a job. And thinking that jobs were very scarce at the time, and to take a job I imagine would be going exile to some you know, small place and uh, my connection to Jewish national concerns was growing. So the idea that the, whatever talent I had, whatever intellectual capital I had, would be going into English literature, which I viewed as pleasant, wonderful, and so forth. But when I thought of what I wanted my life to be worth, I wanted somehow to contribute the Jewish people, but I wanted to be on terms in which I'm good at, which has to do with you know, academics and literature and so forth. So I, I took my, what's called the orals, the doctoral exams at Columbia in the, uh, the spring of my uh, third year there. So 70? Uh, 73, Three? right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I decided I was going to take a year off and figure out what I wanted to do. And, uh, no, so was it 70, 69, 70, 70, 70. no, I think the spring of 72, two. two must have been, right? And uh, during that time, I, I came up with many ideas. I had a very formative conversation with uh, Arthur Cohen, who was uh, an important Jewish theologian, a novelist, and a publisher, who I told him, you know, I. I think I'd really like to do something else, like Midrash or something, you know, but I don't have the training. And he essentially said to me, why not? If you really want to do it, why not do it? You're not too old. And, and it was a kind of like, a, you know, a Zen koan kind of thing of being, you know, clomped in the head and coming out of that saying, maybe I can. And that began a, a very deep change in me where I decided that I wanted to take up a life in Jewish studies. I just didn't know what area of Jewish studies. And my, my initial ass assumption was that it would be something classical. I thought it would be Midrash. 
I went to the university for a year. And the idea was, was that I was going to kind of dispatch my, my dissertation in English. I was going to write about Middlemarch, George Eliot's novel, and get that done. And at the same time, begin this conversion to, to Jewish studies. And Meaning the, you were so close to getting done with that that you might, have, that, you might as well get right, a doctorate. Right, and then I might have to do a second doctorate or whatever, but I wanted yeah. to, to do that. So I spent a year at the Hebrew University as a visiting student, taking a lot of classes in Bible and Midrash. Yeah. And then I spent the next year as a special student at Harvard with the late Professor Tversky, studying medieval texts. And I thought at the time that maybe I wanted to do medieval Hebrew poetry. Then the year after that, he was on leave. I got a postdoc. I finished the dissertation on, on George Eliot. I got a postdoc at the Hebrew University. And that was the crucial year for me when I decided that, uh, that I was really a modern person and I wanted to do modern Hebrew literature and I could build on the, the background I had in Hebrew to, to make this, this transition. And so I really reoriented myself at that time and never went back to English. And uh, it was, for me, uh, a very uh, uh, demanding part of my life because when you're studying English, you have a, a lot of arrogance about the past because people have only been writing lit people have been writing English literary criticism for a hundred years, and a lot of it was very impressionistic, and it's only gotten serious recently. So we felt we were at the top of the wave. When you go to Jewish studies, it's kind of like Maimonides, and you know, who are you? And the 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 sense of being submerged in terms of your self-importance. It took me a long time to kind of climb back to uh, feeling a sense of real citizenship in Jewish studies. That's a whole story unto itself. But, yeah. uh, yeah. Well, so you've mentioned being in Israel several times uh, during the course of this transition. Um, where were you in terms of your feelings about Israel, Zionism, right. kind of a well, speaking of, sp speaking of spin-offs from the New York Havara, one of them was a group called Brera, yes. which was a, um, <clears throat> I think it must have started around... 73. Uh, okay. Uh, well, it, it, no, it started before the 73 war. Right, so... Maybe by about, you know, nine months or something like that. Because I went to Israel on the eve of Yom Kippur of 73, yeah. the war. And I was involved with the, with the starting of Beira, which was about uh, you know, affirmation of Zionism, but against, so the, 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 against the settlements. The previous spring, winter, spring before. Right. And then I was there for the year, and uh, I, <clears throat> I experienced the, 73, the aftermath of the 73 war as a very difficult trauma for Israeli society. You know, all the young men that were lost, the, the loss of the sense of uh, invulnerability, the beginnings more of an association, identification with, with diaspora history. But my colleagues in New York view the 73 war as a gigantic opportunity to, uh, to advance that agenda. They thought it was a kind of like break up of the log jam, and now the peace process could just go forward. And uh, I wrote... Uh, Had you been, but just to go back for a minute, earlier you said that the Six-Day War, in some sense, hadn't particularly... Well, been a lot changed in my own view since 67. That was in, in the years of people, when you're that age, those are, those are many dog years, you know. Yeah. So, uh, so by the early 70s, I was... N I was uh, much more engaged in the world and, and not just in, in these you know, Jewish ritual things. And had ideas about Israel. Yes, together with, with my contemporaries. So I was involved with this Brera, and I broke with them during that year. And I wrote a, an article in response called A Demural on Brera, in which I essentially said that I thought that Brera lacked a sense of a love of the Jewish people, and a sense of empathy with Israel. And it was, you know, uh, so that was really coming to blows with some of the people. I remember Peter Geffen, you know, calling me to his office at Park Avenue Synagogue and 
and you know, like taught, pointing to every line and saying how, how wrong I was. So. Uh, but you you were saying a minute ago that you had been involved in the founding of Bray Rock. I was, but the experience of being in Israel for the war and for the aftermath of the war uh, gave me a different dimension of experience. How would you describe what um, those those people who were involved in founding Bray Ra were uh, thinking? What were their goals, and how were they going about it? What 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 was that process? Well, it was it was. I mean, it, and what I engaged in was a, you know, a, a protest against the, the American Jewish community's, uh, you know, uh, vicarious triumphalism, right. with you know the the easy victory of '67, and the assumption that the territories could be you know held on to, and uh, you know I. I continue to believe that. In other words, I did not move you know to the right. But um, I felt the 73 war changed things. And, uh, and that had been my, my first immersive experience of Israel. I really hadn't been there since I was in high school. So being there and being part of things was different from uh, being in New York and, and engaging it more from a, a kind of a template of American politics. Had you sought out in Israel sort of beginnings of peace movement activity there? I wasn't in those circles. I was in really the Hebrew University and uh, I was not involved politically. I was an observer and you know involved with people's lives, but not uh, and look, I, I want to just you know state for the record that I'm not such a political person. In other words, I, I'm my uh, locus has always been, you know, kind of writing and literature and so forth. And there are people who's, who really fundamentally are, are political people, and that's never yeah. been you know, my temperament. When you came back and heard the, the response of uh, Peter Geffen and others here mm -hmm. to your response article, did it change your mind at all about what, what you've been feeling and trying to articulate in this article? <coughs> Did you get drawn back in at all? No, not so much. I was deeply involved in this, this kind of vocational shift in my life, right. which took an enormous amount out of me to be able to establish myself in Jewish studies. And, uh, I uh, I've been engaged to a young woman over during that year of, of the '73 war, and disengaged, unengaged, in that spring. And uh, I was living in, in in Cambridge and Boston. I did come back to New York, and I did have some involvement with the Chavara in. Uh, you know, 76, 77, 78. Uh, but it was not, not so important to me at that time, yeah. by that time. One of the most appealing aspects of the cover of Vision for you was the way, what you call a lab, as a laboratory for creating a nexus between religious concerns and observance and the social, political issues of the day. And yet many commentators have noted that political activism as a communal activity faded somewhat over time. Bill Novak wrote about this early on. Right. Um, and he really decried the inability, at least in his view, of the Chavara to unite for joint political activity. I'm curious whether you agree um, that it faded, um, and if so, what your thoughts are on what caused that shift? I think the fading maybe had more to do with the professionalization of the individuals involved. That people, it's not, not the same that they just pursued their careers, but many of the careers became entangled in the Jewish community. Uh, people became leaders of various sorts and were channeling their uh, their concerns 
into newly available institutional channels. Um, I, I speak for myself, who was not the biggest political social mover, but, but for me, uh, becoming a professional student of, of Jewish texts and Jewish literature was an important resolution of, of my Jewish identity uh, because I looked at myself and I did not have the capacity to be a religious innovator given my temperament and so forth. And so this is what I had to offer and I was not built for uh, you know, institutional and political work. So this, this is the group that I found where I could take the uh, you know, the gifts I had and offer them in the direction I wanted. I, I think that's true for other people as well in different ways who became leaders in, in organizations uh, of various sorts. Uh, Was the field, can you say a few words about the field that you got involved in as a, as a Jewish uh, scholar? Um, well, it was part of a, uh, something that began to happen in the 70s, which was the establishment of Jewish studies in universities and the Jewish community raising money for uh, the Jewish studies positions in universities in the mode of, uh, you know, ethnic politics, uh, wanting the Jews to become supporters of universities and accepting the money or, in some cases, matching it. Um, and a lot, a lot of people coming out of graduate school at that time. So it was a time when there, there were opportunities that were open. And also there was a, um, a little bit of messianic fervor about what Jewish studies within the university could do in terms of presenting the Jewish people to the world and also in the effect that it would have on Jewish students, which turned out to be pretty much mistaken. Uh, what do you mean? Well, it means that uh, we thought that Jewish students coming to a campus would really be hungry for self-reflective, in the sense of reflecting on their Jewish experience, courses with serious academic backbone to them. In other words, that, that they, would, they would welcome the discourses of the university, the academia, as a way for understanding their experience. Uh, it's, it's turned out that, that some Jewish students really want Jewish identity and that it's available. What they really want more is uh, Jewish community rather than Jewish knowledge of, a, of, a, of an academic sort. And you know, the growth of orthodoxy, the, the, the kinds of study that are offered by the university are not so important. And uh, with the available, you know, the spread of Chabad on campuses, that speaks to a certain kind of Jewish identity. Um, so, for example, my own daughter, who went to a Jewish modern Orthodox Jewish day school and spent a year studying in uh, a women's yeshiva in Israel, when she went to college, uh, had her Jewish identity fulfilled in in ways other than taking Jewish studies courses. She took a Hebrew course or two or something like that. And uh, she was exactly what I com was complaining about for so long until I saw that this, this, is, this is her way as well. So there's Jewish studies is in trouble in general, that it's overproduced. And the demand of students in camp on campuses is moderating. Uh, interest in Hebrew is less. And uh, the hunger is less. And Jewish, Jewish identity is more diffuse. It's an aspect of Jewish students. It's not a hunger for many of them. And for those who are kind of serious about it on a religious basis, the academic study is, is, does not satisfy that need. So uh, at the, in the 70s and 80s, the, the sense of promise of this of the funders in the community, that Jewish studies are, are going to really shore up the identity of Jewish students, prevent intermarriage and so forth, was a very useful uh, ambition and desire at the time. But and not that anybody was pulling anybody's you know, the wool over anybody's eyes, but 
it's turned out, I think, not to be the, the vehicle that people hoped. And for those of us involved in the profession, the disappointment has been that what we represent is a historical understanding of the experience of the Jewish people using the tools of the academy. And the disappointment is that there aren't as many takers for that, even though we believe that that builds Jewish identity rather than, than, erod than eroding it. But that, I mean... And your own field of sort of development of Hebrew, Hebrew culture. Yeah. Um, how does that fit into the overall picture? Was there, how did you come to that? What? Um, well, it's two things. It's about Hebrew and Hebrew culture, but it's about Israel and Hebrew literature. Yes. And for me, the, I was grateful to the Hebraist beginnings I had back in, in Massachusetts, where that was part of the educational culture. And I, I connected, connected with it and felt proud of having that. So that years later, you know, toward the end of a you know, graduate degree in English, I could brush it off enough to be able to uh, make it the basis of, of a second career or a second Did a it second exist era. as a real field at that point? It began to be. I mean, it, it was, there were a couple of professors, but also there was a lot of interest in teaching Hebrew language. Yeah. And there was government support for it. Now, there was the State Department was also funding, you know, language study uh, of less languages that were thought to be strategically important, like Russian and Arabic, and, and Hebrew was somehow in, in that as well. And books could be bought and, and, and uh, you know, instructorship lines could be, could be sub subsidized. For me, the real hook was the, the moment of Hebrew literature at the beginning of the 20th century of figures like Bialik and Agnon, who looked to Hebrew literature and language as a kind of inner Jewish revolution, that this is a way to modernize the Jewish people, but to stay within its central cultural asset. And the, I was most attractive to them also because they were, they were all from a very religious background and they were trying to find connections between that heritage and their being citizens of modernity. Uh, my problem has been that Israeli literature put that behind them a long time ago, put that, those concerns. And so I, I love Israeli literature, I'm involved in it, I write about it a lot, but it, as, as a kind of a Judaic, in terms on the level of Judaic satisfaction, it's, it's remote from that now. And that's why, for a number of years now, my focus is the works of, of S.Y. Agnon, who is the great writer of the 20th century, who, for whom that is his main focus. Uh, just one more thing, but that's the Hebrew literature part. The language part is uh, a very deep conviction that that Hebrew is fundamental to Jewish identity and it's something that can be a bridge between religious Jews and secular Jews and also between Israel and the diaspora. And uh, there was a great moment in American Jewish life, the first part of the 20th century, where there was an attempt to develop a real Hebraist culture here. Yeah. It didn't work for many reasons. But that for many years, I thought that I could wage a battle to put this on the agenda of the American Jewish community. And uh, you could say, well, how did that go? How did that work out for you? So how did that work, work out, out for you? Not very well. Mm -hmm. And um, I still believe that, but I, but I'm, I see now that, that it's, it's tilting windmills to some degree. I uh, think a lot of it is, or a significant piece of it is the pol political context of where we are today. American Jews are today in terms of their relationships, changing relationships. To Israel, Israel. Yeah. I, I, Not really. I, I think to agree to which that is a piece of, of, of Jewishness being demoted to an aspect of people's identity. That's one module put together with other modules. But I think the greatest thing is, uh, is not a Jewish thing, but it's the um, power of English the arrogance of American Jewish, of, of, Jew, of American culture, where we believe that if there's anything of really enduring importance in the world, it will come to us in translation. 
and the, uh, the, the difficulty the Jewish leaders have with acknowledging a weakness or shortcoming, which has to do with language, with Hebrew language, and the, 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 the defensiveness, the need to feel as if you don't really need Hebrew to be you know, an authentic Jew. And so there are a lot of factors that I think are not just about the, the uh, you know, slipping or attenuating relations with Israel. Because if Hebrew isn't just about Israel, it's just the language of you know, the prayer book, or the language of uh, you know, the great you know, foundational stories of, uh, of the Bible and of everything. It's really, and it's, you know, it's, it's I think, tragic in a truly, you know, Greek sense, because it's a renunciation without the awareness of what's being renounced. And I could go on, but you get the idea. So let's um, turn now to some reflections on how this period of your involvement in the New York Hover on its founding period affected you over the course of your life and, and its broader impact on the American Jewish community. So you were a member of New York Hover Off from its inception till about 1980 with some periods of yeah. being away. Um, do you have a sense of what the most um, significant ways that the New York Hover Off itself changed or evolved over that period of time? From these very first few years that we've concentrated on? Well, the big change is the, the, the lowering of the intensity of communal interaction and the kind of uh, over time backing away from the notion of this being a total community which involves you know a serious commitment in everybody's part and the expectation that people will be involved in each other's lives and that everybody would be doing study and prayer and and this and that to uh, you know, a, uh, a kind of a, a lower intensity, you know, social, you know, Jewish group. Uh, but at the same time, what's happening is that that model is seeding many changes in the Jewish community more broadly. Uh, you know, for example, the, uh, you know, the egalitarian independent minyanim. It's very much an outgrowth of the Havarot. You mean the, the independent name of recent of recent decades? Or where when do you trace right. that to? Well, the the group that I'm part of, Minyan Ma'at, which was at first entirely independent and then became part of the Anche Chesed community. And started when? Began in the mid mid late seventies. Mm -hmm. So you can think of that as a kind of you know, the baton handed over and some of the people, it's interesting, that got started because people, you know, alumni of the, of the Boston Havara found themselves living in New York and wanted something to, that so would... this is Mark right. Strasfeld. Right. Sharon Strasfeld, Sh Sharon Barry, Holtz, Richard Siegel. Siegel. Um, but, but the model that they wanted was something that, that was not as totalistic. They were not aiming for the kind of, uh, you know, deeply engaging on all levels. They wanted basically a liturgical community that would have some activities, but, but it was about, you know, Shabbos morning davening. Uh, as 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 the, the signature, you know, activity. So it was a kind of a new notion of a, you know, of a congregation. Uh, and and from what I can see, that is what has been picked up in many of the, many of the, the independent minyanim, which will have communal meals and and so forth. Well, celebration but, of life cycle and yeah, other kinds yeah, of right, which you know event. communities Your do. Cycle and, events. But the key. Transfers are the the, the anti-clericalism. There's no rabbi leader in, in most cases, and egalitarianism clearly, and you know collaborative governance and, and you know, providence. 
so that uh, and you know the use of nigunim and uh, you know the the more uh, experimental dimensions have you know quieted down. Yeah. So as you mentioned, you lived in in Washington D.C. for a period and yeah. also in, in the Boston area for a period, and yet you didn't get particularly involved with either for Rosh or for Brennan during Co that time. Correct. What's correct. your sense of why? Why not? Because I didn't like the experimental mode in, in, in services, which was, uh, the Newton menu is that's, is something different, but Farbrengen was, was too loose and goosey for me. I mean, it's also that I, I, I had, uh, it's a parallel discussion, but I, I had come to terms with the fact that the, that the New York Havara world was, was not going to be a halacha community. And, uh, and I wanted to be with people who had some kind of commitments along those lines. Uh, and so, uh, and I was more comfortable in terms of my prayer experience being in a situation which did not call for a lot of self-consciousness and this week is going to be this way, next week it's going to be that way. Yeah. I wanted to be consoled by competent performance of the liturgy and, and the Torah reading, rather than having to be annoyed by illiteracy. That's my temperament. Yeah. So by the time you got involved with Minyan Ma'at, as it was being yeah. founded here in New York, what was the status of the New York cover -up? Was it, was it You know, it's, it's a good question. I think it, I think it existed vestigially. Um, I'm not the right person to ask because I wasn't really a participant by that time. Some people say, when asked, when were you, like on, on the pre-interview questionnaire that you filled out, yeah. what was the period of your involvement? They'll say 1979 or 1980 to the present. What do they mean when they say the present? Is there a New York cover that's functioning? I think there's a list and there is, as far as I know, a, uh, a lunch on the second day of Rosh Hashanah here. I'm not aware of other activities, but again... So basically that, it's a friendship group at this point that meets... Yeah, I think so. ...on some specific times throughout that, during the year, but yeah. very, not very often. But I would call those more reunion functions than, you know, it's not the primary community. I mean, there may be people who you know, aren't attached to other communities also, I mean, mm -hmm. or... Yeah. Um, are there ways in which you would say your Jewish life and ideas about spirituality and um, observance have diverged from what you were thinking during the time you were involved with the New York Cobra? It's a hard question to answer because, you know, the, the answer may look like, you know, I've just become uh, less open, ex experimental, and I don't view it that way. I view it as um, my coming to terms with the nature of my, my, my temperament as a Jew, uh, knowing what's important to me, wanting to be in a community where that's held in some way, uh, and uh, it's acknowledgement also that the perhaps the, the principal Jewish contribution, a product of my life in terms of my creative investment, doesn't occur in my synagogue community, but in the cultural work that I do, the academic work that I do. Uh, so for me, that's the, the front line of what challenges me and, you know, uh, 
makes me develop and where I experiment and try to be the best I can be and so forth. Whereas the, the communal life, especially having children, has been more about creating a, uh, a rich and consistent uh, nurturing community that, that has a, kind of a level of literacy that, that I'm comfortable with. It's been pretty consistent, as you say, in terms of your feelings about it over time. It's just you were comfortable. I guess so. <laughs> I guess so. It's, it's just that the years of the Havara, I, I had that feeling, but, but felt that, that I was the odd man out. You've come to peace with it. Yeah, I think so. I think so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, did you ever get involved um, in Havara activities at the national level, like in the Havara Summer Institute? No, I, I participated in one or two, uh, maybe three. And I guess I gave a class, classes, I don't remember, I think so, but... But no, it was never, uh, never a magnet for me. Any sense of why not? Well, for the very reason that, that what I had wanted was not a movement, but a community. And, uh, and to go back to the you know, elitism, canard or charge or, or true description, whichever, uh, I always believed in the the creative contribution of uh, intense communities. Uh, so that, and I, I think that it was borne out also by, you know, we were, th that whatever product that we produced in this hothouse laboratory uh, became used and valuable to, to other people later on. But, but it was in the nature of the, uh, protection of, of the discourse. Uh, so, uh, you, what, what was your question? I know that I... I it had to do with the, the, your participation. Why? Right. So, so the, the broadening out mm -hmm. from the intense community to some kind of organization. I always perceived the, the Havara Institutes as basically a way for people who did not live in these communities, you have access to them in terms of, as a way for them to get something of that and to be participants. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that, and that the intensity. I mean, pardon? Maybe it didn't have the intensity of week to week or regular. Right, but right. But it certainly has created a community. Yeah. No, I. It's something that I yeah. affirm and mm -hmm. so forth. That it wasn't, you know, the role for me or. Uh, um. You said some things about the relationship between um, involvement in the Chavara and one's occupational choice. Right. Um, is there anything else you want to say about that in terms of the impact of the Chavara on American Jewish life? Well, look, I think there are you know, major American you know, Jewish institutions that are headed by people who are involved in Havarot, but in the New York Havarot in particular. And, uh, I mean, there's no Havarot brand per se, but, but I, I, I really believe that, uh, that they informed things we were doing, the Havarot, and the Havarot informed them. But, but that certain basic values and styles were infused or disseminated into important venues in American Jewish life. So looking back at the Chavara's vision, holistic vision really, regarding community and social justice and prayer and learning, mm -hmm. what would you say were its greatest strengths? What were its greatest weaknesses? And to what extent do you see that those sort of having been infused into sort of the larger community and its institutions? as here we are now in the second decade of the 21st century. Well, the, the things we're going to cite, I just want to hasten to mention that they're not, you know, Havara branded innovations, but, mm -hmm. but things that were kind of cultivated there. So I think there's, uh, we've seen an enormous change in, in what prayer is about in liturgy. Uh, you are here on West End Avenue, two floors above the apartment of Debbie Friedman, who, who lived here. 
Uh, she was not part of the Chavara, per se. Who was Debbie Friedman? Debbie Friedman is a, a Jewish folk singer who also went into the area of, of Jewish prayer and became really foundational to changing the norms in the reform movement for uh, what constitutes prayer service. Uh, so it's, it's a kind of parallel, somewhat later development, but the idea of prayer being uh, responsibility of the individual, the use of melody, of nigun, the way in which the Chavurah, especially Chavurah Shalom, appropriated the, from the repertoire of Hasidism into making that available as a style of worship in, in rather cold and remote you know, you know, con congregations. The uh, closing of the space between worshipers and religious leaders, uh, even physically in terms of how synagogues are designed today and, 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 and con constituted the uh, change role of, of, of rabbis and, and cantors as being uh, not remote and orators, uh, but facilitators who are, you know, uh, whose role it is to kind of stimulate other people to, 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 to teach Torah. Uh, we haven't talked about the Jewish catalog, but the aspect of the counterculture reflected in that was of uh, urging the individual to appropriate uh, Jewish ritual life in a the senses hand on do it te textural uh, hand do it yourself way, which I think was a great democratization of of, of Jewish experience, and a, a very interesting example of the, of the intersection between kind of waves of changes in American culture and and the impact. I mean, who before that, you know, had their own ketubot written. Or when I grew up in my conservative congregation, the only place there was the sukkah was the shul. You know, things have changed very much, or the idea of, of uh, people owning, uh, you know, beautiful uh, havdalah sets. You know, all these things were uh, a, a way in which uh, that tactile dimension of life was moved into the home. Uh, so there, there, <coughs> the idea of the empowerment of laity uh, is also fundamental in this way. Uh, so these are all, you know, uh, together with, I think, more, you know, collabor collaborative styles. Those are, I think, part, you know, very important. And I, I think also within large institutions like large synagogues, the recognition that there have to be smaller modules that so many synagogues have appropriated the Havara idea to uh, enable you know, young families to meet Friday nights and that, they, that it won't just be in the synagogue, but it'll be people's homes as well. Those are all uh, offshoots. And finally, do you see, do you see the Havara um, and the offshoots that it has spawned as continuing to have an influence and an impact on, on how we conceptualize Jewish life and strengthen Jewish life uh, throughout this century? I don't know. I, th I think the ideas have been um, disseminated and have a life of their own. I mean, such as, which I didn't mention before, gender, which is. You know, that, that has its own momentum, even if it, let's say, began in, not in Boston at all, but in, in Havarat uh, near, near, near Havarat, you know, as Ezra Nashim. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think they'll be marked as Havara uh, distillates so much in the future, but, but it's part of the chain of, of how those things you know, got going. Yeah. Uh, do you do you think of yourself as a quote cover Jew? No. no. 
not as a present identity, you know, at, at, at one time, but, but not now. Okay, well, That's is there anything else you'd like to add? I guess not. I think we did it. Okay. Thank you very much, Alan. You're very welcome. Wonderful advice.